I have very little time, so I'm going to get straight to the point, and I'm going to drive home a few things that, uh, uh, in my opinion, represent foundations for care of patients with, with uh, cervical spinal cord injury in 2020. And for the trainees who are joining us today, I would, uh, I would encourage you um, uh, to get uh, more aggressive in your home institutions if you are recognizing care that deviates from, from the principles that I'm talking about. And that uh, for those of you who are in practice, I, I, I hope that what I'm saying resonates with what each of you are doing um, each day. So uh, these are my disclosures. And uh, I will, I will uh, lay, lay down these principles in the context of, of a case. So this is a 31-year-old male, unhelmeted motorcyclist, and uh, who's brought into the trauma bay, and he's a C5 Asia C. So this is someone with a clear spinal cord injury. Asia C means that uh, he does have strength in multiple muscle groups, or at least one muscle group, but the, the majority of the muscle groups are less than anti-gravity and strength. And let's just get straight to the point. So what is this? How are we going to take care of this? When are we going to take care of this? And, uh, and then what is the ongoing management that we can do in this patient to give him the best possible chance uh, for maximum recovery? So here is the uh, sagittal reconstruction out laterally that shows the joint. And all I need is this single picture to really predict what it's going to look like out laterally. So what is this? This is a unilateral facet dislocation because we have less than 50% anterolisthesis. When you see this slight anterolisthesis, this is almost always a perched facet and not a true dislocated facet. This is the classic picture of unilateral facet fracture dislocation. And then when someone has bilateral facet fracture dislocation, uh, you see greater than 50% anterolisthesis. So you really can make the diagnosis in the overwhelming majority of, of cases just, just through that, that, that single picture that I'm showing you here. So what are you going to do? And uh, there, are, there are multiple treatment options at your, at your disposal. Um, in my hands for this case, I will classically um, attempt open, uh, sorry, sorry, attempt close reduction. If I am successful with closed reduction, then uh, I will do an, an anterior approach. Um, if I'm unsuccessful at closed reduction, then I will typically do a posterior approach and drill down the facet and, uh, uh, and reduce the, the, the dislocation from a posterior approach and then lock it in um, with a short segment construct. And then if it's bilateral facet fracture dislocation, I have a very strong inclination towards an anterior posterior 360 degree uh, uh, treatment for that patient population. When will you take this? So that's, that's the what and the how. Uh, and so in my hands, the, the, this is a unilateral facet fracture dislocation. I will attempt close reduction. The success of close reduction dictates whether I do an anterior or posterior approach. That's the what and the how. When? When will you take this patient to the OR? Now, later, tomorrow, or at your convenience? And this last one is regrettably the answer uh, too frequently. Uh, this one often dovetails, sorry, this C often dovetails with D, where, uh, where, where practitioners will put these patients on the OR schedule for the next day after their micro disc and, and, uh, uh, and outpatient ACDF. You know, people with conditions that have been festering for weeks to months and, and uh, over and above the patient who has an acute life-threatening problem. Um, later, okay, but why? And so frankly, in my opinion, in modern care for this patient population, there is actually only one answer, which is now. And you, you need to have a reason for the answer to be anything other than A, now. And, uh, and, and in, in large measure, it's really the only medically justifiable answer. That if you have active neural element compression in the setting of a neurologic deficit, the answer is now. So in our institution, for the patient with a neurologic deficit referable to spinal column trauma, and in the presence of ongoing neural element compression, we go straight from the trauma bay to the operating room virtually every single time. 
will you give this patient steroids? So now we have two things that I will, uh, I'll discuss with respect to ongoing management, because we've already talked about what, we've talked about how, we've talked about when. Um, and then there are two questions of ongoing management. One is about steroids and one is about blood pressure management. And uh, this is and remains an incredibly controversial question. Um, this is a 31 year old male with an incomplete spinal cord injury. So we're talking about a young person who has some element of, uh, of neurologic function. And I know that uh, when the guidelines for the management of spinal cord injury were updated by many of our fr many of uh, friends of many of us uh, who are who are uh, helping to teach this this course today, um, there was this interesting change, which was to change it from an opinion that treatment with methylprednisolone is an option to a level one recommendation, which would be reflective of what in the old nomenclature would be a standard, but a level one rec recommendation that administration of methylprednisolone is not recommended. And uh, this remains something that uh, we have watched this massive pendulum swing where it is actually now very, very rare, if ever, that patients with spinal cord injuries get steroids. But I just wanna caution people that, that understanding the data that underlies this can really help you understand what to do. And if you really understand the original NASCIS trials, Back in the early 90s, this was um, principally a disease of young males. And so we're talking about the same kind of person in this, um, uh, in, in this case. And if you look at patients, not patients who were plegic, but patients who were paretic, like this person, because we didn't actually have the INSKI exam at that time, that, that classification system didn't exist. So Asia, A, B, C, D, E didn't exist at this time. So that's why we're seeing this data presented differently. But paretic with variable sensory loss is an Asia C patient. And in the methylprednisolone group, there was significant recovery of motor function at six months with the administration of steroids. So in my hands, I still view this as an option. And that if I have a young person with an incomplete injury, I am giving that person steroids for their spinal cord injury. And then the last thing that we'll talk about is blood pressure management. So what blood pressure parameter would you put in place for this patient? MAP greater than 60, 70, 85, or 100? Well, the classic thing is to say a MAP greater than 85. Where does that answer come from? It comes from one study, and I think we should be asking ourselves if this is old thinking. And that one study was out of Phoenix in the late 1990s. Mark Hadley was a part of this effort. Vale was the first author, and they had a historical cohort compared against a cohort where they, where they put in um, swan gans catheters and arterial lines and maintained maps over 85, and they said, oh, look, the patients we did that to seemed to do better than the patients that historically we took care of without doing this. But it should be noted that this patient is never, that this study has never been repeated and it's never actually been done in a prospective multi-center fashion. There is in fact a study ongoing right now called the Temple Trial that is meant to um, re-ask this question. But I, what I wanna tell you guys is that um, we're in a perpetual state of getting better and we're actually taking this one step further. And this is our institution, um, latching on and riding the coattails of some very smart people. And I think Brian Kwan out of Vancouver is, is really the global thought leader in spinal cord injury right now. And this has been a huge effort of his, is to make this conversion to, to management by spinal cord perfusion pressure instead of mean arterial pressure. And spinal cord perfusion pressure is analogous to cerebral perfusion pressure. And if you want to treat traumatic brain injury, you have to understand cerebral perfusion pressure, and you get that by subtracting ICP from MAP. Well, in spinal cord injury, we now want to do this by subtracting intrathecal pressure from mean arterial pressure, and we achieve this by placing a lumbar drain and transducing intrathecal pressure through a lumbar drain. And what we've learned from this work by Brian Kwan and others is that if you have a spinal cord perfusion pressure greater than 60, you have a significantly higher likelihood of improving 
over the next six to 12 months. And in fact, the relative risk, the likelihood of improving, of experiencing improvement over the next, next six to 12 months is four to six times higher in people who have a spinal cord perfusion pressure greater than 60 than those who don't. And so we now have this as standard practice at UCSF, at our institution in Pittsburgh and in in Vancouver, and this practice is starting to build and spread. And I would just encourage you guys to think about this as another medical option for taking care of these complex patients, which is to place a lumbar drain, which we now do in every single person admitted to our hospital who is in Asia C or worse with the neurologic deficit resulting from spinal column trauma. And we measure their spinal cord perfusion pressures. We target greater than 65 so that we're making sure it's really above 60. And we do that for up to five days or as long as they need to be in the, in the ICU. It's a very simple algorithm. If your, spa, if your systolic blood pressure is low, make it high. If your systolic blood pressure is normal and your spinal cord perfusion pressure is low, but your intrathecal pressure is high, drain CSF. It's, it's actually very simple. Um, and for us, um, this is now standard care. We're combining that with a study called the CASPER trial, where we're also trying to collect the spinal fluid in the blood and look for um, biomarkers that give us a sense of injury severity, but can also prognose the people who are more likely to recover over time than others. And I will stop there and entertain any questions. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much, David. That was uh, very interesting. And, uh, I think it's going to change how we manage these patients. Um, I'm going to inquire with my partners at Shock Trauma to see why we're not doing this yet. <laughs> so, yeah, Jim, um, have you started doing this in Philadelphia yet? Hey, Dave, Jim, did Jim, you hear that? I, I, that was great talk, and I thank you because you answered a lot of the things I'm going to bring up and probably saved me some time. Uh, one <laughs> thing I just want to ask you about, which I always found is interesting. One of the problems with those trials about people that you can't get their maps up to is we know that the people that lose their autonomic dysfunction tend yeah. to have worse prognostic outcome. So is it really that we can't get their maps above 60 or that those patients have two severe neurologic injuries? Yeah, that, that's, that, that, that that's great. Sense. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I don't think that we have sufficient sample sizes in this to actually tease out that specific question. But you're basically asking, it, is, this, is it a chicken, chicken or the egg? It is, is, is the capacity to actually treat these pressures more reflective of, um, uh, of the injury severity or of the intervention to go after the injury severity? And so so we don't, we, yeah. yeah. No, that, that, that's exactly what I'm saying. And, and I'm, I think this is the right thing to do. But I just, I, one, I think about that one part. And the second thing I think about is, and I'm going to throw it back to you, why five days? Yeah, right. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, in, the, in, the, in the traumatic brain injury world, we sort of have the same kind of five-day concept, but we all know that that's not how it practically occurs. You know, someone who hasn't had a single ICP problem for three days and is showing an, a, a neurologic exam improvement will discontinue neuromonitoring. There are other people that 10, 14, 15 days later, we are still working our way through the pathophysiology and still targeting things. And so I don't think that this is a hard and fast five days. So basically for us, we actively measure and treat spinal cord perfusion pressure for as long as the patient needs intensive care management. And when the patient is sufficient, sufficiently improved and stabilized to transition out of the ICU, that's when we back off on the spinal cord perfusion pressure management and just focus on avoiding hypotension. All right. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Charlie, can I ask one question? I know we're, yeah, sure. we're behind. So uh, for the audience, again, this is sad that we don't have uh, the David versus Jim uh, fight. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is really a, uh, the first drawback I see at a virtual meeting. Seeing those two guys live going head to head, mano a mano is a, is a true treat. Hey, so now here's a big question for you, David. So in general, has it been a trend change towards uh, when medically safe, after an anterior quick uh, stabilization to do a multi-level posterior decompression fusions in these severe cervical cord injuries to give the cord maximum expansion capability. Yeah, no, that, 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 that's a great, great comment, Jens. And, and I really think that that is one of the key next questions for us to gain a much greater sense of clarity on. That a very strong argument can be made 
that, uh, that these patients, just like in traumatic brain injury, we do decompressive craniectomies, that patients should have a posterior cervical decompression and in fact should have a durotomy and an expansile durotomy to, um, uh, to, to maximize the, um, the space and, and room for the, for the spinal cord, which really drives spinal cord perfusion pressure, right? And Brian Kwan starting to gain some data about where you measure the intrathecal pressure in reference to where the injury is, because it's clear that intrathecal pressure is different in different places in the spine. And so when you have, if you can actually measure intrathecal pressure in the mid cervical spine in a patient who that, that's their injury level and their intrathecal pressure is high, that person may very well benefit just like the, the traumatic brain injury patient does from, uh, from a decompressive procedure, a true decompressive procedure that goes even past laminectomies and includes opening the dura and doing expansile duraplasty. Hey, hey Dave, and I know we're over, so this is going to be really quick. The problem with that concept is the, is the brain has the arachnoid around it so you can expand. In the spinal cord, you cannot expand with a very tense arachnoid band around it. And so the question goes one step further, do you have to do a myelotomy? Yeah, right. Which I'll, I'll show a slide on that. Great. Okay, very good. That was Thank an you. excellent uh, discussion. Thanks very much.